to us about the pain of operations and how you move to having healthy operations. Testing one, two. How you guys doing? Can you hear me up the back? Speak, speak up. Yeah, well, that's the way I'm going to be talking. So there may be a bit of a rah every now and again, but this is going to be kind of my tone. So good. Deal with it. We good? Cool. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, talk and I've entitled Healthy Operations. Uh, this isn't the first talk I was going to give. Originally I was going to tell you an epic tale of how we upgraded monitoring on thousands of servers and it was going to be an amazing story. But instead, I'm going to talk about something that's a little closer to my heart and something that is infinitely more important than upgrading monitoring and that's being a healthy operator. Day to day, I have dealt with huge stresses and have suffered from depression because of it. I see the same symptoms and conditions in not just some of my colleagues, but also some of my other friends who work in IT and also many other people around me here today. I hope that this is different from any other talk on the subject. Um, and in the end, I can give you something to hopefully smile about and maybe have a bit of a laugh. Uh, the only disclaimer to this is that I am not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not even a counsellor, and my views and points I'm about to raise and discuss are my own personal ones. And they may not necessarily be reflected, or reflected by my employer, Acquia, or by anyone else for that matter. All that said, let's get on to the talk about me. Um, in 2001, I installed Mandrake 9.1. That was my very first install. And within 30 minutes, I had to basically do a reinstall because I'd entered the root password somewhere, done something, and it broke. I learned what not to do. In 2006, I started my first full-time IT job as a systems administrator for a government department. And ever since then, I've been living, breathing, eating, and shitting Linux, both at work and at home. Um, I'm also proud to say that I've done Linux from scratch and if you've never done it before, I highly recommend doing it. It is awesome fun. Um, the, one of the cool things I've found about it is you need make to make make. Think about that. So I work for Acquia. We do enterprise level Drupal as a service. Uh, Drupal is a CMS that is GPL'd and we provide the service and support for hosting it at scale. Uh, an example of who an enterprise customer would be, um, I'm proud to say that we're actually doing stuff for the Australian federal government. Um, the federal government is standardising on Drupal for all of their external facing public uh, departments. Uh, it's a project called GovCMS. Um, the code is being standardised and released entirely free, which is amazing for our federal government to do. Uh, massive kudos to John Sheridan for uh, really like, trying to implement free and open solutions because they are the better way to do things. If you follow Twitter, AUSGovCTO is his handle. But anyway, one quarter of our company are remote. That's about 140 people who are not in an office and work from their own house or a coffee shop somewhere. By show of hands, how many people here work remotely? Please. Sometimes. Okay, probably got about 20% of the room, which is still a decent amount. And how many people here uh, work in operations or operational roles? Okay, that's a lot more people, uh, 50 to 60 percent I reckon. Um, cool, well I've been working remote for, it will be three years in May, um, and I uh, used to work in a cube farm uh, where we had about 40 people in the office and it used to be a parcel of information, yes we did make the paper fit around his bookshelf, it was awesome. But it was great because there were, um, there's always something happening, always people walking past, you could stand up, peek over the partition and say, hey, how about that game of sports? And it was good and it was kind of social. I went from that to the spare room of my house, um, where basically I would have four ways to get to the outside world all through my screen. There was the, an inbox where I could read tickets and see talk about Drupal and things relative to people in an office like, oh, there's an ice cream cake in the office today, that's super. 
Um, we had uh, we run XMPP, so we have our own chat server, and everyone's got their own rooms, and that's how you sort of communicate with people generally. And also had a grey and white terminal. Well, at the time it was black and white, but I've upgraded my theme since then. The fourth thing that I had back when I first started was a weekly phone call. Um, we now use G+, so you can actually see the person on the other end of the line, and it's great. So for our daily Kanban meetings, our team easily uh, interact with people from EU uh, and also from uh, Portland, the main offices in Boston. And it's all done through video conferencing and really helps break down those walls. And we also do a weekly meeting now. Uh, so all of the overnight uh, crew can actually have a chance to see the rest of the team, uh, voice our concerns or opinions, ask questions, and actually be a part of the team and actually see them. It's so much better than it used to be. But the first thing that really helped break down that barrier of uh, working remote was that every week I had a phone call with my boss, John O'Keefe, seen here standing on a box. <laughs> He's going to kill me for that. So he's based in Boston, and he'd stay up till 19.30, his local time, and we'd just have a talk. So it's something that we did every week regardless, and it had to be, well, it's something you really stuck with, and there'd even be weeks where we didn't talk about work at all, and we'd just talk about it in like sci-fi or movies and games and all that, so he loves playing games and all that, so... It's good to just sit down and have a bit of a talk. And that was my first sort of line to the outside world. And there was a massive help. And I still remember that in the second week, um, we'd done the intro pleasantries and he asked, so Phil, how are you going? I said, yeah, not too bad. You know, uh, things start to get the hang of these. He said, no, how are you going? And I knew what he was asking. And it's like, well, kind of shit. It's so like, I didn't know what this was and couldn't get into that and I had no idea of what was happening during the US daytime and not having anyone around during the daytime to talk to was kind of freaking me out a bit. But my greatest thanks to him for helping me work through those first hurdles and every week would break down a new wall and we could find a better way of doing things. And I think that's the first lesson you can probably pick up from this talk that if you manage or uh, work with someone remote, don't assume that they have any idea or that they know what is going on or assume that they're going to fess up and tell you that something's broken or wrong. Please go out of your way to ask them, how are you going? Get in contact with them and stay in contact with them. Do it regularly, not just as a one-off because you maybe heard that they were under a bit of stress, whatever. Stay in regular contact. Talk about things other than work. And if you are one of those people who has been approached and been asked, how are you going? Don't be too proud. If you're feeling down, you're feeling upset, say so. If something's broken, do something about it. Right. So I'm going to switch gears and change speed for a bit. See what I did there. And dive into what it is to be sort of down and out, or as I call it, bedrock. So... At stress at its worst, I was waking up at least once a night thinking about work and work-related things, sometimes even two or three times. I was so tired when waking up, I could do an extra couple of hours sleep every single day. And it was because I had tormented sleep, I wasn't well rested. I used to get up early and do a 16 or a 20k ride twice a week. But the thought of waking up any earlier than I was already getting to, uh, that I was already waking up was utterly crippling. I was too exhausted at the end of every day to want to even leave my own house as well because I hadn't had good sleep. I'd wake up tired, I'd be exhausted from the day and I'd just be too flat to do anything about it. Because I was never rested, I could never get that energy back. Well, it's too easy to get into the negative feedback loop and say and do negative things when you are surrounded by negativity. So you've actually got to go and try and go out of your way to break that loop and try to make something positive of it. This was exacerbated by you know, being in ops, you are interrupt driven. When an alert goes off, you've got to answer it. And also not having any sleep, you just scattered. You can't actually work effectively. You are burnt out. And at its worst, when thinking about some people or some things, I'd be so angry and so uptight, I could feel it in my chest, and that was a massive alarm bell for me. Uh, because you're stressed, your body reacts, and because your body is stressed, your mind then reacts and tenses up. 
if you've never played Minecraft, if you have a pulse and you are breathing, you can play Minecraft. Please. So where does it all come from? Well, there are personal stresses as well as there are work stresses. So the personal is that I wasn't doing enough to take care of myself. Um, and there are also things that are just part of the job that well, you've got to deal with and find out ways of dealing with. So other personal stresses, in over three years I hadn't had more than one week off completely removed from work. Um, until last November when I booked three weeks holiday over the Christmas and New Year break and it was kind of indicative uh, that uh, I need to take a break because I said I'm taking three weeks off, no one even questioned me, not even once. It's like, you want to take a break? Do it! Exercise is one of the best things you can do for your mind and for your body. It helps you remove from the everyday as well as well, it helps you stay fit and healthy. You live longer, you live better, you live a happier life. Like even going outside to listen to the birds and uh, birds sing and listen to the air, um, wind rustling through the trees is good for you. Some people do IT as a hobby as well as their main vocation, but if you're never removing yourself from the keyboard, from the screen, there is no definition between what is work time and what is your play time. You really do need to do something other than computer work in your spare time. Even if it's a hobby like RC cars or like I don't know, amateur rocketry, if you do that sort of thing, like take up reading, do something that is not in front of a computer. So there's also the stress of being in ops. These are the work related ones that Everyone else in the company could generally take some time off, like sales, HR, engineering, finance, and to a point support. They could not rock up to work for a couple of days, and you know what? Things would kind of run okay. But if ops was not to be there for two days, and a server went down or a site went down, it would stay there until someone else logged back in and fixed it up. So everyone in the company is relying on you doing your job. The customers are relying on you doing your job. End users are relying on you doing your job. There's a lot of things to deal with. We are very interrupt driven. It's our job because uptime is the number one priority. Like whatever you were doing beforehand, you've got to stop it and you've got to pick up the alert. If you were doing like some, making a script or doing some coding and, or doing some ticket work or even actioning another alert, you've got to stop that, pick up the next alert. You're always uh, like got that interrupt there. My co-worker Emily coined this about ops people, that we are lazy adrenaline junkies. And it's generally because we're not the type to sort of go out and go dirt bike riding or jumping out of a plane, which I recommend you do at some point, it's freaking awesome. But we generally love jumping headlong into problems to fix them. Because that's a rush, like, I love nothing more than when there's a critical situation, jumping in and well, owning it and fixing it up and being the one to get it back online. Most recently, like during the Super Bowl, uh, Bruno Mars did the halftime show. We run his site, and I was the one who kept his site online when it was being smashed by thousands of teenagers all across the world. But I enjoyed that because I fixed it. But that kind of leads to people becoming heroes that, oh, they'll always jump in and fix it. They'll always be there for that last minute uh, miracle when it's needed. And you just end up going into crit after crit after crit and wearing yourself down. Jumping on grenades all the time is not good for you. We've had to deal with growing pains. In May 2012, we had uh, 2,000 servers. We went up to 5,000 servers, then to 8,000. October the same year, 9,000. November the same year, 10,000. Upgrading takes longer. The uh, greater chance of breakages um, there's because of the whole meet time between failure. Um, we had more customers and more custom code. Being remote. Being in an office, you pick up things just from being there, like you hear conversations in passing that you don't hear or you don't get when you're remote. You cannot learn via osmosis. When I log in for the day, I've generally got close to 100 emails to read. And then, of course, if there's any emergencies happening, they've got to pick up from Portland and run with them. So by the time you've actually gone through emails and you've got everything settled and everything's under control, and OK, ready to do some work and ask people some questions, Portland's logged off and Boston is definitely asleep. So you then have to either wake someone up or send an email, or employee GS DAS. So <laughs> Chris O'Neill, 
uh, works for our support department. He was the first sort of remote that I knew. Um, he was in the same spot as me that he didn't even realise what he was getting into being remote for a company based in Boston. But we helped each other out and like, he would ask, how do I do this? It's like, I have no idea, let's find out. And he's like, okay, don't do that, try it a different way. And I'd ask the same of him, how do I do this? And he would help me out. We have the external factors of like, people not understanding that <laughs> people are behind the computer. Like, a person selling a feature that we don't support just to make a sale has just made a one-off system that we now have to administer and maintain and take care of. What now, like a person promising dollar customer, a thing that at a certain time means that they've just promised the person is going to stay up, do overtime, or be overloaded to get that job done. Because, well, ops are heroes, they always take care of things. No, <laughs> they're still people. Um, customers can write their own code on our platform. It's Drupal, it's open source, you can change whatever you want. Yeah, you can use any or all Drupal modules. <laughs> Good luck to you. As well as the fact that, well, some people could be better at coding. <laughs> Customers take themselves down, that's nothing you've got to deal with. Adding more tools. So, if you've got a tool that's only valid for one version of your platform, you've got one set of servers which you can use a new tool, but you've got to actually, for the rest of them, until you've upgraded them, use the old one. You've got to do the same thing in two different ways until everything is upgraded. It's extra stuff. So, it is a lot of things to deal with, be responsible for, to break and to fix. But you know what? There are things we can do to make good from bad. We can turn things around. Keep others in check. Lend a hand. Reach out. If you see someone needs a hand, ask them, are you okay? Do you need help? And also don't be too proud to ask for help and actually go out and get assistance. You are not alone. It's too easy to just keep working. Like in IT, there is always something more to do. You need to take time to kick back and relax. Holidays are more than a privilege, they are a necessity. Take them. Spend time outside, go for a walk, a ride, a run, or a bit of a mosey if that's what you do. We also need to get better at marketing ourselves um, um, and being better communicators. This is the most interesting because, well, we're all intelligent people who are generally quite humble and reserved. And we have good ideas and sometimes they seem to get lost in the background noise because we aren't so good at representing ourselves. And so in being uh, better at conveying ideas, we can help actually get attention to the issues that are at hand. Like businesses don't do things because it's a good idea, they do them because there is proof that an idea is solid. So we need to get better at explaining ourselves to our managers, to our bosses, etc. Don't check work email after the end of the day. It's too easy to have your work email and your personal email on your own phone. So you can be at home like, oh, we'll just check on this one thing and like, oh, well, while I'm here, no, don't do it. Ensure you keep the separation. You have to avoid checking on work things. Else, private time becomes uh, work time. Rubber ducking, it works in programming. So basically the premise is to detail a problem you're facing into something that Paul can't even speak English, um, doesn't even talk, and is completely inanimate. And in doing so, you break a problem down into its most basic parts. And the same can be good for stressful situations because it's generally not just one problem, there's generally a whole bunch of them. So you need to take the time to break it all down, analyze and explain it. So the closing postulations, ah, dang, I didn't get that one right. So these aren't just operational issues, they do affect other people in IT. I'm only speaking from the operations point of view. Um, if you have felt or feel the same as I did, make a change, go and get a bit of help and start positive feedback loops. Karma really should be better than it is, but I would like to give a big thanks to my colleagues uh, who hopefully will get to see this at some point. Um, uh, these are the people who, are, who stand beside me on the front lines when there's bullets whizzing past my head. These are the people I escalate to and who escalate to me and we help each other out. We are um, an awesome team that I love being a part of. And of course, we are hiring. <laughs> Acu.com screws. <laughs> Tell them I sent you, I'll get you a bottle of whatever you want. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure.
Okay, we've got about five minutes until the next speaker starts. Um, if anyone has any questions, we can take them while um, Nathan yeah, is yeah. getting set up. That one's on.